Well, I want to thank uh, Neil for putting together the kids' talks every week. They've been sensational, haven't they? And a real delight to enjoy that little teaching time with the sheets that he's worked so hard to put together. I want to thank the One family uh, for helping in today's kids' talk and for helping us understand a little bit more about the passage we're about to look at. I'm not going to read it. Uh, You've heard uh, Pete read the whole passage already. Uh, It should be open there in your Bibles, uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, through to chapter 9, verse 8. Uh, It's up on the screen or it's in the service sheets that you might have printed off. The outline for the sermon uh, is there as well. And if you'd like to offer comments or feedback, even ask questions, and we had a great number of questions last week, uh, please feel free to use the comments box down the bottom uh, of the service page. A number of people have asked me about uh, the comments and the questions and whether some of the more general questions could be made available uh, in the emails I send out each Monday. And so I'm going to try and do that, uh, making sure that identities remain private. I'm at point one on the outline. Uh, Marie Kondo has made a name for herself and a very lucrative business by reordering people's lives and spaces. Put simply, she's helped people tidy up. Uh, From her perspective, if you spend time on her website and read interviews with her, she's helping people to reorder their worlds so that they may experience great joy and bring great joy. From her perspective, she's helping people put things in their right place to set things aright so that they can have the maximum joy possible. I read an interview with her in the weekend Australian last weekend. All sorts of thoughts were going through my mind, not least of which was my study needs tidying. In this world that seems so disordered at the moment, however, I was struck by how much we need to meet the one who doesn't just tidy up our offices, who doesn't just rearrange our bedrooms and kitchens. We need to meet the one who reorders the whole world from the natural to the supernatural to the whole human being. We need to meet Jesus as he truly is, as God in the flesh. Let me, let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word Thank you for Matthew. Thank you that we can read this gospel, this good news that is the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in the fulfilment of your commitment to this world. Father, please work on us by your spirit, applying this revelation of Jesus as God in the flesh to our lives and reordering them, setting them aright. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, Matthew wants his readers to meet Jesus. Uh, he is writing about Jesus because Jesus is the heart of the gospel, the good news that God has done exactly as he promised for this whole world, that God has dealt with the broken state of this world by rolling back the curse of judgment on sin and bringing his approval. That's all happened in this man, Jesus. And Matthew wants his readers to meet Jesus. So he writes this account of his life. It's at least a biography, but really it's more than that, isn't it? It's the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Matthew's been making sure that we meet Jesus as he really is, as he works in the world. We've seen the authority of Jesus as the teacher and the preacher, as he gathered his close followers on that mountaintop in Matthew chapters 5 to 7, as the crowds listened in. We've seen the authority of Jesus as the healer, the saviour, as he deals with the whole package of sin, as he makes his way through the world. And we've seen the authority of Jesus as Lord, as the one who defines what it means to follow him wholeheartedly. Matthew chapter 4 verse 23 and Matthew chapter 9 verse 35 give us the bookends of this section showing Jesus at work, at preaching and teaching and healing the identity revealed as he does this work. And the whole picture of Jesus at work finishes with his second large teaching chunk in chapters 10 to 12, a section we'll cover in a few weeks' time. 
Well, Jesus had given the command to his followers to go over the water, Matthew chapter 8, verse 18, to another region. I'm at point three on the outline. They obey him and the group sets off across the Sea of Galilee. As they go, nature rears its ugly head. Look there in verse 24. Suddenly a violent storm arose on the sea, so the the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was sleeping. It's a megastorm. It's a storm enough to dwarf the boat they're in, presumably a fishing boat that had belonged to one of Jesus' disciples. As it sinks into the troughs of those ginormous waves, it effectively disappears. It's a storm enough to scare the living daylights out of the disciples, some of whom are fishermen. Look at verse 25. So the disciples came and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we're going to die. In contrast with Jesus, he's striking. He's fast asleep in the boat. He's not worried. They wake him. Their fear is conveyed in three short, sharp, almost breathless words. Lord, save, dying. It's such a wonderful picture, such a dramatic picture that Matthew has painted for us as readers at this point. Jesus speaks, rises. He's undeniably at the centre of these events. At first he speaks to his disciples, look at verse 26, but he said to them, why are you fearful, you of little faith? His words to his disciples mirror his very own words from the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. It seems that Jesus is drawing to the attention of the disciples the truth that if you trust Jesus as Lord, if you're focused on the priority of the kingdom of God, what have you got to fear? Put simply, if Jesus is your boss, if the kingdom of God is your priority and God himself is your father, then you'll have what you need to be God's people He's not deriding their faith, but he's exhorting them to trust as they say they do. And then he speaks to nature. Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. His words to nature are a rebuke. Isn't that a striking idea? Across the three Gospels written by Matthew, Mark and Luke, Each author has this event and they all use the same word. Jesus rebuked nature. He commands the elements to return to their rightful place, to be calm and still before him. That's a powerful statement. It's an immediate display of authority and identity. Leo Morris hints that there might have been demonic forces at work stirring up the storm. It's a legitimate observation given how sudden and ferocious that storm is. Whether it's this or whether it's not, Jesus' authority itself is awesome. And the disciples recognize this. Look at verse 27. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the seas obey him. They've never met a type of man like this. They've never met a man who could rule creation as it should be ruled. They've never met a man who can reorder creation, rebuke it, putting it right. That's the unmistakable image we have of Jesus here, isn't it? The man who reorders creation, who puts the disorderly and unruly, even rebellious creation back in its right order. And when you consider again who Jesus is, remember Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the one promised by God through Abraham's family to deal with the cursed world and bring God's approval, the one promised by God who rule the universe from David's family, well, his rebuke of crea- creation should be expected, shouldn't it? I mean, who else could bring blessing to the world? Who else could deal with the curse of sin which has broken the world? Who else could deal with how damaged the world is? Who else could put the natural back together if not the one promised by God, perhaps God himself? Jesus and his disciples reach the other side of the water. I'm at point four on the outline. Uh, It really is the other side when you look at the passage in every sense of those words. As you scan the description that Matthew gives of the scene that greets them, as an original reader, you would have felt an undeniable dirtiness about this area, an otherworldly sense. The region of the Gadarenes was a non-Jewish region. The men that met Jesus and his disciples are demon-possessed. 
They emerge from the graveyard. They're violent and abusive. In the background, there's a large mob of pigs. Everything about the scene cries out, unclean, dirty, disordered. And the two men recognised Jesus. Look at verse 29. Suddenly they shouted, what have you to do with us, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? We've already seen that Jesus has power over the demons. Remember that evening scene after Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law where everything was dark on every level? Here we see that power expressed, however, more completely. These demons know Jesus. They don't have to ask what kind of man is this. They know him. And these demons know the authority of Jesus. Did you see the way they spoke to him? The way in which they described their relationship with Jesus and time there in verse 29? These demons know that there is the time. The moment when the authority of Jesus as king over the universe will be displayed. And here he is, the one who'll judge them in the time, standing in the flesh in front of them. They know that at that time they'll be vanquished once for all. And so when they meet Jesus here, they fear that he's brought forward that final moment of their existence, their torment. They fear that he's brought it forward to the presence. In essence, they stand there fearful knowing that they're confronted by God in the flesh. And they beg Jesus. Look there in verses 30 to 31. Now a long way off from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. If you drive us out, the demons begged him, send us into the herd of pigs. Jesus responds, doesn't he, in verse 32. Go, he told them. So when they'd come out, they entered the pigs and suddenly the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the water. It's a simple command from Jesus. It's meant to recall for us as readers the very same command that Jesus had spoken to the boss of the demons, Satan himself, back in Matthew 4 verse 10. There Jesus was tempted to display his identity in an alternative way, if you are the Son of God. Here he just displays his identity. Jesus has the authority to reorder the supernatural, to set the supernatural right. The one who already has the end verdict in his power now displays that authority and power in the present world. And so the demons are cast out. The pigs are affected. The two demoniacs are presumably set right and re-established as humans. The swineherds run to the nearby town. Look at verse 33. Then the men who tended them fled. They went into the city and reported everything, especially what had happened to those who were demon-possessed. Now, we don't know what the swineherds said. We can guess and read between the lines. The way the language seems to work, they ran to the town and told them everything and also what had happened to the two men. And knowing humans and the occupation of these men, it's not hard to imagine that the dominant theme was economic. The pigs are gone. Oh, by the way, you know those two demon-possessed blokes? They're now in their right mind and the road's safe and the graveyard's okay. And the result is surprising. Look at verse 34. At that, the whole town went out to meet Jesus. When they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. So the result you'd expect is that <laughs> Jesus has just reordered the supernatural world in a small area. Jesus has just displayed uh, in the here and now the power that he'll display on the last day of the universe. Jesus has just set the demons in their right place, returned two men to their right place and made the area safe again. And the townspeople say, hey, listen, it'll be better if you weren't here. I think a clue is offered by Matthew in his writing. Uh, It's striking that in verse 31... The demons begged Jesus, and in verse 34, the whole town begged Jesus. Exactly the same word. I think we're meant to draw the connection. Uh, It's almost as if the townspeople were happier when they had the pigs and the demons. The townspeople wanted to live in a world where it was dirty and disordered. So long as they had their pigs, they wanted that rather than the reordered world where the two men are restored. The safety of the road is restored. The demons are banished. It's such a striking contrast, isn't it? 
the authority of Jesus, the image of Jesus that we have here is of the man who can not just reorder the natural but set right the supernatural. And the townspeople want nothing to do with him. Well, Jesus listens to the townspeople. Did you see that? There in chapter 9, verse 1, I'm at point 5 on the outline. That's amazing, isn't it? And he heads back over the water. And when he reaches his hometown, he's met by a very different welcoming party to the one he'd just met in the Gadarenes. Look there in verse 2. Just then some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a stretcher. A paralyzed man is carried by some men on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Have courage, son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus sees their faith, sees that they have heard his words somehow, somewhere, and they take those words as true and live like it. They come to him. They don't ask for anything, do they? And Jesus pronounces a remarkable verdict. He displays exactly the same power that he had over the supernatural, the power of the final verdict over all things, the verdict delivered at the time. He pronounces that again for this man, this paralyzed man, in the present. He says, your sins are forgiven. That's remarkable on so many levels, isn't it? On our purely human level, it's remarkable because we don't expect that. We'd much rather the legs to work, wouldn't we? It's remarkable because Jesus has just demonstrated something that the demons knew, that he has the power of the eternal verdict over all things. He can pronounce it now, in this day and age. It's remarkable because this man's sins are forgiven at that point, that immediate moment. It's remarkable because when you weave all these truths together, Jesus has just completely revealed his identity. He is God in the flesh. Think on that. If sin is the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not. If sin is committed against God alone, which is what is said right throughout the Bible, not least Psalm 51 verse 4, then the only one who can say your sins are forgiven is God alone. And Jesus has just said that is who he is. Jesus has just displayed the very thing that his own name, his own coming are focused on. Remember what the angel said to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21? Well, it's exactly the conclusion that those watching make. Look there in verse 3. At this, some of the scribes said among themselves, he's blaspheming. The scribes, the religious lawyers, are grossly offended by Jesus' revelation. Uh, It smacks to their hearts and minds, and I think they're not mumbling amongst themselves. They're saying it in their hearts and minds. It, It smacks of blasphemy, of violating the unique authority and significance of God. Ironically, Jesus then displays his godness, doesn't he? Uh, Look there in verse 4. But perceiving their thoughts... Jesus said, why are you thinking evil things in your hearts? For which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But so you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he told the paralytic, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. And he got up and went home. As the paralyzed man was carried to Jesus, in verse 2, Jesus was seeing their faith. As these scribes are thinking evil thoughts, Jesus is seeing their hearts the same word. It's a significant confrontation, isn't it? Not to accept Jesus' revelation. That's an evil thought. To refuse to recognize Jesus as he is, that's wickedness. The question Jesus then poses the scribes is in one sense an exercise in the hypothetical, at least for human beings. It borders on the ridiculous because no human can do either easily. That's why I think Jesus doesn't answer his own question. Did you notice that? Instead, he cuts to the heart of the matter. I am the human being who is the son of man 
who has all authority on heaven and earth, who is God in the flesh. And let me show you what that looks like. Get up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man does. The revelation of Jesus as God comes at the climax of these three miracles. Jesus sets the natural right. Jesus sets the supernatural right. Jesus then sets a whole man right, deals with his sins and deals with his physical brokenness. Only God could do that. Jesus must be God. The conclusion is unavoidable. The crowd itself reaches it. Verse 8, when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and gave glory to God who had given such authority to men. They were awestruck because they'd seen God in the flesh. Marie Kondo loves to set things right. I'm at point six on the outline. Uh, In her philosophy, driven by the desire for joy, such tidying and ordering is about bringing maximum joy, not only to yourself but to the world. But let, let me reassure you from personal experience that such tidying is a constant battle, isn't it? It's a constant battle with no end in sight. Jesus comes to set things right completely and he has the authority to do it completely. Matthew wants us to see this. The authority of Jesus to reorder the natural, the supernatural, the whole human is clear. He sets the natural right, rebuking the broken and physical world, putting it in right order. He sets the supernatural right, commanding the demons to go, displaying the power that will come in all completeness at the end of all things. And then, confronted by a broken man, he sets the whole human right, starting with the root cause, which is sin, and bringing restoration to the whole body. Jesus clearly has the authority to set things right, which means his identity is unmistakable. He must be God. Only the creator God can restore the natural. Only the supreme God can banish the supernatural. Only the supreme creator God who made man in his own image, who is offended and rebelled against by sin, only that God can forgive sin and restore the human in the flesh. Only God can set things right. How do you react to that authority and identity of Jesus? Matthew is so obviously interested in our reaction as readers and witnesses. He makes this concern clear right throughout these three events because each has the reaction of the observers. Did you notice that? It's almost as if he's saying, "Which? where do you stand in these three events? Jesus' authority and identity raise the question for people as they deal with him, what do I do with this man, God in the flesh? You could join those who are opposed to him, who'd prefer their pigs over a world set right, who'd prefer their laws over God making a human being whole. You could join those people. Oppose Jesus, refuse to accept him as he truly is, who accept your own godness over his godness. That would be wicked, wouldn't it? Jesus' authority and identity can also bring immense comfort and restoration. It's a wonderful truth to be proclaimed in the whole world, that the only one who can set the natural right, the supernatural right, the whole human right, the only one who can do that has actually come and lived and died and risen to do exactly that. Faced by an invisible virus that has turned our world upside down, faced by an invisible virus that has exposed our disorderly and unruly rebellion, That is a wonderful truth, isn't it? Jesus is God who has come to set the world aright. Jesus is God who's come to deal with sin and all the damage it has done to us in this world. Jesus is God 
who has come to forgive you and set you aright. You can come to him alone and he will restore you. Isn't that wonderful? What do you make of Jesus? Are you struggling to fit him into a normal human box? Would you prefer him to leave the district so he can hang with your pigs? Do you reject his revelation as God in the flesh? Or do you hear him, see him, meet him? Do you come to him and know that your sins are forgiven, that you can be restored in body and mind, that the supernatural is set right, and the world is reordered. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we meet Jesus who sets things right. Father, bring us to him so that we can be set right, restored, reordered, and know the one who delights in doing that for us. Father, in this pandemic world, which we know has always been broken, but we sense it at the moment. We know it at the moment, even more sharply in this world. Please help us to proclaim the one who has come to set things right. In Jesus' name, amen.